Friends, welcome. Welcome to another in our series, The Life and Teachings of Jesus, part three, as Roxanne has mentioned. And uh, today, you know, the first two really, they're about what does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to be a disciple? This one, now we're moving into the territory of, well, how did Jesus make disciples? We're going to look at seven principles today. And uh, later in the series, we're going to zero in on three really big areas, the final three messages of the series. But today, it's an overview of seven of the key principles. Um, And this one I've titled Jesus Discipleship Model. Jesus Discipleship Model. And uh, discipleship, of course, it's got to start with calling someone to follow, calling someone to believe. So let's have a look at those early beginnings. Uh, Mark 1.14, it says this, After John was put in prison, John the Baptist, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. I've always thought when we um, uh, think in terms of fishing in uh, a lot of our uh, modern settings, and, and as many of you know, I'm into a bit of fishing, I remember when I was at uh, Bible college, we had an evangelism book that, we was, that was our textbook for uh, that subject of evangelism, and it had a guy on the front holding up a trout lure. And the idea was, of course, of the trout lure, you catch one trout with that lure, don't you? Peter didn't fish like that, did he? He used the net. He got a whole bunch at once. Isn't that interesting? And uh, that's a concept that I'll explore at some point perhaps when we get into another season when we're talking about evangelism. But that's an initial thing there. It's good to have that in our minds. There's lots of new things to learn from these ancient scriptures. Anyway, uh, what you see there, when I I was a new believer, I remember reading that and I just thought to myself, okay, so Jesus has got an impression from his father, God the Father. It's told him, hey, Andrew, Peter. And and Jesus is walking along the shore and he gets this prompting from the Holy Spirit Those two, never met them before, come, follow me. But actually, a close reading of Scripture, that's not really the case. If you have a close look, you realise he already knew Peter. He already knew Andrew. There was already a relationship. Now, John's Gospel gives us a little bit of an insight about this. Have a look here at John 1.35. It says, the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look. The Lamb of God. Now, let's uh, let's try try and imagine this for the moment. As you know, John the Baptist, he has many disciples. Two of them are standing next to him. We discover one of them is Andrew in a minute. And and he says to them, there he is, that guy. He's the Lamb of God. He's the one who will take away the sins of the world. He's the one. And and they take off and they start following him. We read a little bit more about it. Uh, It says in uh, verse 37, When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? Uh, They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, "Um, where are you staying? (laughs) I don't think they quite knew what to say. (laughs) Where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you'll see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It It was about four in the afternoon. Got the idea? So they... They follow after Jesus, they have a little chat with him, and they continue to walk to where he's staying. And by then it's four o'clock by the time they arrive. It says they spent the day with him. Perhaps it was a long walk. Um, but, of course, it seems like, likely there in the evening they chat with him, you know, and spend a few hours with him. And it seems from the passage that by the end of that time, Andrew was no longer convinced because John the Baptist said he's the dude. Um, he's convinced because he spent time with Jesus, and he's convinced he's the Messiah. And he wants to tell his brother about it. Let's pick it up in verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we've found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. So a little bit of an insight, therefore, is clearly Jesus was developing a relationship with these guys already. He knew them, and in the journey of that relationship, the time came when he decided who those key disciples were to be. And that's what we picked up when we read Mark, 
That's when he'd made the decision. He called them at that point. But he may, may have known them for some weeks before that, possibly even months. Certainly, I think, weeks. Um, the first point is this. Discipleship starts with the calling. The calling. The person has to be brought to that place where they think, hey, I do want to follow Jesus. I do believe in Jesus. Um, you can't be a disciple if you don't know the Lord. I'm not saying discipleship in one sense can't start, but at, in the early stages of discipleship, you are called to faith in Jesus, to follow him. Step one. Mark 1.38 says this. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I've come. Notice that. So he travelled throughout Galilee preaching in their synagogues. And you got the idea? So Jesus is travelling around. He's preaching in all manner of synagogues. And who's with him? A bunch of disciples. And so they're, they're in the front row. They're getting taught by Jesus all the time. In the journey of being a disciple, of being discipled, clearly Jesus models teaching. Teaching was key, number two. Teaching. Um, I was in... Uh, uh, Tom's first Bible study as he was taking us through the series. And um, one of the things that Tom explained, that at the heart of the concept of discipleship is this idea of teaching. It, we, we're, we're learners when we're being discipled. And can I suggest, because I, I'm going to be encouraging you to consider making a disciple. Um, if you're making a disciple yourself, you're, you're helping someone learn and grow. One of the things I would always encourage them to do, my pastor did this as well, I remember. So if you're reaching out to someone or you're discipling a new believer, bring them to church. Encourage them to sit under the taught word of God. That's important. And, of course, you yourself, you're going to become their teacher. And I'll say a little bit later how you, at making a disciple, how you can be equipped to teach that new believer. Mark 4.10. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. You notice that for a moment. So Jesus is often teaching in the synagogues or even teaching the crowds, and he uses parables a lot, stories. There's power in the way we present stories. And we've got that image of Jesus, but here you notice when they were alone, when the crowds dissipated or perhaps synagogue service was over, his disciples and some others, they would ask him questions. There was discussion. And uh, so can I suggest this? Another key in discipleship is discussion. And as Roxanne's mentioned, you know, the small group Bible studies that are also doing this course, this discussion takes place in those Bible studies. It's part of the journey of discipleship. You know, I often think a great place for a new believer to engage in that early discussion is the Alpha course. It's all based around food and discussion, isn't it? Uh, and... Um, that's, that's a great way for a new believer to learn what it is to talk about their newfound faith or their not-quite-yet-faith. Uh, and, of course, um, uh, we've already mentioned um, that the standard for many churches is that Bible study group. Let's move on. Uh, Mark one we We're going to look here at uh, a whole bunch of little passages. Mark one thirty two says, That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who were ill and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases and drove out many demons. You got the picture? So his disciples are there, and they're watching Jesus. They're watching how he prays for the sick. They're watching how he deals with some sort of demonic power. They're observing. They're learning. He's modelling that to them. He's modelling power encounters. Another example, Mark 8, 1 to 3. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. You can tell he's trying to model this. He's telling us, I have compassion. I feel compassion for these people. He's like, he's really trying to make it obvious. I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have had nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. He's modeling that, that love, compassion. Uh, another example, Luke 11, 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. I don't know, perhaps it was Jesus' passion or his faith or, or just the way he prayed. And they thought, oh, that's awesome. I'd like to learn how to pray more like that. He modelled prayer. And I, let me give you one more. Uh, Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. 
So as part of his teaching, it's not just that the disciples are sitting there learning. He's modelling how to teach. They're learning of this is how he communicates. So number four. Number four, part of the discipleship process is modelling. Because uh, to be honest, if um, God in his grace opens a door for you to lead someone to Christ and ultimately disciple them, you're going to model the Christian faith whether you know it or not, you will be. <laughs> I remember as a, a new believer, um, my pastor took me under his wing and a couple of other guys as well, and he would do deliberate things to disciple us. And one of the things he said to me one day, look, I've, I've been asked to preach at this um, church camp at Riverbend. And so there's a church that invited me out to do their, their long weekend camp. And he wanted me to come with him. It's a long drive, so there's a lot of talking in the car. And then he wanted me to hang around. And uh, one of the things that I saw was, you know, I watch how Kim, Pastor Kim, would pray for people. I'd watch how Pastor Kim would counsel people. And um, I can still remember, I, I've heard some lecturers say, you know, people retain only, I don't know, 5 10% of a sermon or something like that. I don't know if that's true. And the reason I say it's not true. What was Kim preaching at the time? He was preaching from Ephesians. It's a long time ago. He's preaching from Ephesians, talking about putting off of the old, bringing on the new. And as he was explaining that, one of the guys, he came forward and he's chatting. And he's grown up in the church. But I could see, and clearly Kim could see, he wasn't a born-again Christian. And I watched Kim as he helped him journey through that and invite Jesus into his heart as Lord and Saviour. He was modelling all manner of ministry at that camp, and he did in other settings as well. Have a look here in Mark 6, 7. Calling the twelve to them, to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed with oil many people who were ill and healed them. So you've got the idea Jesus has been modelling a heap of stuff. Well, now he's going to send them out to do it. They're going to have a crack at it. And, um, you know, it's uh, the idea of sending is something that we perhaps don't talk a lot about in discipleship, but it's clearly there, isn't it? It was part of what he did with the 12. He did this with the bigger group, the 70 as well. Number five, sending. Sending. I don't know, how do we bring that into our lives? I'm not sure. How, what do we do? What do we do? Well, this is what my pastor did with me. When I was a new believer, he said, um, you need to get out and do some missional stuff. And so one of the things he said, um, Youth Dimension are, are running you know, uh, Blue Moose events, evangelistic events. And um, I went on several of those. First one I went on, led a guy called Rowan to Christ. And uh, the idea was, I want you to get out and do some mission. Get out and do some evangelistic stuff. How does sending work for you? Well, can I suggest God is wanting to send you all the time in your workplace? You're in a mission field. I, I came to faith in Christ in my workplace. You know, it might be a neighbour. could be someone you play sport with. The fact is he's wanting to send you with that gospel message that's in your heart all the time, whoever you're rubbing shoulders with. Sometimes it can be a complete stranger. Mark 6.30 says this, The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. They've been out on that mission. What have they come, they come, uh, come back to do? To talk about it with Jesus. Report back to him. Can I suggest this? Number six, report. There's the reporting side of discipleship. So when uh, Kim told me to go do those Blue Moose missions, I'd come back and he'd ask me all about it. And we'd chat, and chat about a whole bunch of different things that happened. There was the reporting back. And I think in the journey of discipleship, if God blesses you with leading someone to Christ and you're willing to commit to discipling that person, that's going to be part of the journey. It's going to be you know, reporting back with different things that they're getting exposure to, different things they're doing, and some of that may be missional sorts of stuff. You know, um, Mark Williams is a guy in my workplace who kept on trying to talk about spiritual things with me. He got me at the right time. I was just starting to open up to Christ. I was 22 at the time, not from a church background. We had, I estimate, 30 spiritual conversations somewhere around there. Now, what I didn't know, he was reporting back all the time. Who's he reporting back to? He went to his small group Bible study 
And he was, they, one of, how they ran their Bibles, they'd start with some worship, with a guitar, acoustic guitar sort of thing, and then they'd have a prayer time. As part of their prayer time, every week they would pray for their unchurched friends. Mark would report about me. I had a great conversation with Lee this week, and they'd pray for me. Interesting. And eventually that reporting became, Lee's here tonight. <laughs> Still wasn't saved, but I came along. He got me there eventually. Wasn't too much longer after that, though. I came to faith. 631, last one. Then because so many people were coming and going that they didn't even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Finally, I want to suggest number seven, reflection. Reflection should be part of discipleship. There's a place of getting alone with God and, and uh, any person making a disciple should be encouraging that. There needs to be a place of letting God give you some space to reflect on the journey that you have been on as a new believer, whether that's because you've done some sort of missional thing or whether there's been you know, an intense time of uh, a seminar or something you've been to. But this reflection helps in the journey of growing in God. Seven things, seven principles that I can suggest that Jesus clearly used. Number one, calling. It starts with calling to that place of belief, of salvation. Number one, calling, teaching, discussion, modelling, sending, reporting, reflection. We say them again, calling, teaching, discussion, modelling, sending, reporting and reflection. Good question to ask about any model is, well, did it work? Did it actually work? The day of um, Pentecost came. Leading up to that day, there wasn't a big crowd gathered. There was about 120 believers, we're told, were gathered. Jesus had attracted some huge crowds, but actually when it comes to the serious ones, there was about 120 that were gathering in prayer. And 11 of those would have been the disciples because we're told that they were there. Judas wasn't there anymore. He turned out to be a bad egg. He um, He had 70 that he sent out as well, a bigger team of people that were sent out on mission. It's likely most of them were there. There might have been a few bad eggs amongst them as well, but most of them were probably there as well. And a few others might have been spouses and so forth that were there. About 120 people. But then the day of Pentecost came. Now, you've got to remember, these people have been discipled by Jesus. You know, the, the smaller group and the bigger group have been raised up by Jesus. The day of Pentecost came, and you know, Peter, his right-hand man, he gets up and preaches. The Spirit of God moves. 3,000 people give their lives to Christ. How did the church cope with all those people? Well, they had about 120 key leaders that had been trained up. And so the infrastructure was there. They had a good leadership team, a large leadership team. Let's see what it looked like, that early church. See how healthy it appears. Acts 2.42, it says they, this is the early church, they devoted themselves to the apostle teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. I mean, that's extraordinary, isn't it? The early church, they didn't meet on Sundays for worship. Only they met every single morning in the temple courts for worship and the preached word of God. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now that little snapshot tells us that I think Jesus had done a good job. This seems like a strong, healthy, vibrant church. You know, I want to make the suggestion that one of our problems today is uh, our seminaries. Our seminaries tend to, and the one I went to is supposed to be pretty practical, but to be honest, to be honest, it was still very left brain in the way it trained us. We did have to do short-term missions. That was really good. But most of it was academic training. And the problem is when you, you go to a seminary, and it's largely academic training, it's not very practical, I don't think it, you know, it looks the best. You end up a little bit like this fella. Ever seen anyone like this? A lot of academic stuff going on there, but there's something wrong. There's something wrong, isn't there? He doesn't look quite right, that guy, does he? I think the problem is, like I shared in the very first sermon about Mr. the Reverend Botros, he realised that with his rapidly growing ministry, there's no point in just getting people from his seminary, the Coptic seminary. He realised he needed to train people on the job. He trained 20 ministers and that enabled his church to actually grow like wildfire, grew to 5,000 people and started with 15. 
But those key leaders he was raising up were essential for that growth. Um, Charles Spurgeon believed this in his day. You know, Charles Spurgeon, he, um, he said, I'll quote him, um, the current seminaries produce sapless essayists, sapless essayists. So in his day, and as you know, for those who don't know much about Spurgeon, he, um, he was called to a church in Britain and um, the, the tabernacle, as it became known, just grew in a phenomenal way. Um, Many, many people coming to faith in Jesus Christ. The church ended up with a 14,000 membership. The auditorium sat 6,000 people. They filled it twice a Sunday. Um, and I mean filled it to the brim. Uh, but Spurgeon looked at the seminaries of his time and he said they produce sapless essayists. So people that end up looking a bit like this, where they can tune out, turn out a finely tuned essay, an academic work, a theological work, but when it comes to actual practical ministry, you remember we talked about the vine when we had it here the first week, and I talked about the sap of the vine. You have to draw from the essence of the vine, from the sap, to really be connected with Jesus, just as the grapes can only produce, you know, the, the grape branches can only produce fruit if they're drawing from the sap of the vine. When he said sapless, he meant they're not drawing from the strength of Jesus. They're not anointed people. You know, and so he ended up starting his own college, which was a much more practical form of training. Obviously, they wouldn't get pulpit opportunity at the big church, but they started planting missional churches around the city. And uh, those young guys, of course, did a lot of ministry in Spurgeon's church, but they could also go out and they had a preaching role in those missional churches. We know these words so well. Jesus parting words to his disciples before he ascended. Matthew 28, 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. But remember what I said about discipleship before? It's got to start. He's telling his, his, his disciples to go out and make more disciples and of all nations, not just locals, but... It's got to start with what? They're going to tell those people about Jesus and they're going to encourage them to believe in Jesus. That's the start. It starts with the calling. And I want to make the suggestion that for you and I, any church we're a part of should be putting tools in your hand to help you reach your unchurched friends. We've been to many conferences over the years and one of the big themes in the uh, in some of the conferences I've been to, is telling pastors you need to be creating evangelistic opportunities within your church. Put tools in the hands of your members. You can't just tell them to share the gospel. You need to create opportunities where that effort can be furthered. Well, we're we going to do that this Easter. We've got uh, something we're going to put on called the follower. Have we got a slide for that? You might recognise some of these people. The follower is a multimedia production including live presentations in drama, dance and band items. It is also peppered with previously prepared film clips. It tells the story of Jesus' life and crucifixion through the eyes of his follower Peter and is, in pla and is placed in the modern setting of the 21st century. So we're going to be putting that on here. And the idea is uh, Easter Sunday, it's a great opportunity to invite people. But I do know as well, people do go away at Easter quite a lot. And I don't want you to miss out. So a week before Easter on a Saturday night, and Solomon's uh, pastor from the Arabic church, he's inviting the Arabic church to that Saturday night as well. Um, the idea is on the Saturday night, one week before Easter, we're going to put it on here as, as well. So there's two opportunities. This is a tool in your hands. Uh, we're going to have some... Professionally produced flyers that will look similar to that. It's not identical, but similar to that. Um, and the idea is, hey, invite them along to this. Invitational evangelism is one of the easiest forms. Invite them along. Uh, and uh, be praying. You know, there are plenty of people of prayer in this church. Be praying that God would open people's minds and hearts, that as people are invited, they will actually come. Now, what do we do? Because uh, getting invited to a show uh, is only the start of it, isn't it? Well, as part of that presentation, about a little over three quarters of the way through it, and towards the end of it, there's a natural spot for a pastor or evangelist to get up. 
and draw the themes together and share the gospel. And that's exactly what I'll be doing. And so um, I spent a bit of time over that, about 15 minutes or so. Uh, it's got some great themes in it. Uh, and uh, I use that as a platform to talk about Jesus. Uh, but basically, to tell you a little bit about the, the story, it's really um, the life of Jesus through the eyes of his follower, Peter. And, um, but, like I said, it's set in the 21st century, so it's not quite the same as some accounts we've seen. Now, when I do this, um, when I'm talking about Jesus, I'm actually going to be encouraging people to fill things in in a card. I'll make about three or four points, and I want them to jot down that point. Uh, now, I'm going to encourage you to be jotting down those points too because if you don't model writing on the card, well, why should a visitor bother to do that? So please model it. Something else that we're going to be asking at the beginning of the show, we're going to ask people to fill in their details. So it's great you can be here today, but one of the things we're going to do, we'd love to give everyone a gift we can't afford to, but what we can do is we can give a few people a gift. And one of the gifts that I'm thinking we will give out is the Bible series. And So probably give out about three of them. And there'll be some chocolates and stuff, of course, but uh, we're giving them something significant. I don't care if you win it as a Christian. You enjoy the series. It's not always available on Netflix and Stan and whatever, so you, you know, here's, you've got a reliable source here. So they're getting a decent gift. But as part of getting that gift, it's an encouragement. Hey, fill in your details. Get a gift. Because we're going to draw three of them out, and three of you will get a gift. Towards the end of the sermon, uh, one of the things I'm going to be saying, there will be three boxes on that little thing they're filling out. And one of them will say, I've chosen to become a follower today. There's another box that will say, I want to find out more. And then there's a third box that says, I want to do the Alpha course. Now, when we get to that important point near the end of the message, I'll have probably prayed a salvation prayer just before that. I want you to be pulling out your card and praying for people at that point. Because they're... they're, uh, Billy Graham used to call it the hour of decision. You know. This is a big decision they're making at that point. Am I going to reject Jesus or am I going to accept him or am I at least going to express the interest? Take your card out and be prayerful at that moment. So this is the journey. And the idea is people who filled in that card, we we'll collect them up, we have their details, and we'll follow them up. And Alpha, the plan is to run it uh, on Tuesday nights, um, not the following Tuesday because it's still school holidays around that time. It's the one after that. So it will, Alpha would commence on the 26th of April, 6.30, Tuesday evenings here. Carol, Carol in our church, has already offered to cook all the meals for it, which is very lovely of her. Now, that's the first tool in your hand. But what if you do lead someone to Christ? What if, and one of your friends makes a decision. They say, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah I'm, I want to become a follower of Jesus. What will you do about that? Well, let me make some suggestions. First of all, sit with them at the Alpha table. Be with them. You know, do Alpha with them. You're there. Because they might have some questions after the course that uh, they, well, they want to talk with someone about. Didn't get that bit. You're there to talk with them about that. And after the Alpha course, it doesn't end there. So I'm going to encourage you to disciple that new believer. One person for one year and meeting with them for about one hour a week. One person, one year, one hour a week, including that... 10 weeks or so in the Alpha course. Now, I've got a series of books that I've used before. These first two are pretty well known and very used. Lessons on Assurance by the Navigators. I did this as a new believer. This was really helpful. Five weeks helps ground that person in newfound faith. Next one is Lessons on Christian Living, also the Navigators. Gives them the Christian basics. What do you, how do you do this with the person? Go out for a coffee. Sit down. With the Bible on your phone or a hard copy, go through those, those questions, look at those scriptures, and it grounds them in the basics of Christianity. But we need more than them getting grounded in their faith. We need them to become a disciple maker. They're a new believer. They need to become a disciple maker too. So it's very strategic what we're doing right now, this book, The Life and Teachings of Jesus. You're not just going through that for yourself. You're learning this because you're going to take a new believer through it, one-on-one. And then finally, of course, that new believer, they've probably got a lot of unchurched friends. And so fourth term this year, we're going to do a series titled Spring Into Action. We spring by then, spring into action. It's based in Philemon 1.6, be active in sharing your faith. 
we look at eight different examples in the New Testament where the gospel is shared in a whole variety of different ways. Looking at Jesus sitting one-on-one, having a chat with someone. Looking at Matthew, throws a big party, mixes up the disciples and his, his tax-collecting friends and sees what's ha- what happens. We look at Paul, how he talks about the Christian in the workaday environment and how he can be a witness there. But we also look at Paul and how he shares his story as an evangelistic tool. You know, we look at a whole bunch of different things. But the hope is you also then take them through this book and just help equip them to get good at sharing the gospel. And the idea is by the end of a year of this, they're actually grounded and they're a gospel-sharing disciple-maker. Seriously, it can happen. Goodness, it happened to me. Far out. It can happen to anyone if it can happen to me. So you might be thinking, man, that's a lot of sessions. Yeah, well, it's 27 sessions in those books. Same number of the books of the New Testament. So I thought, that's, that's a good number. <laughs> and then if you include Alpha, which is 10 sessions of Alpha plus the three Holy Spirit sessions, Holy Spirit Day, that's 13. So that's 40. There's another good number. So it's 40 sessions. But I, I think in a year of about 40 sessions, they're going to be grounded. And like I said... Not just grounded, but they can be a gospel-sharing disciple-maker. Now, by the way, just to add to this, if you attend uh, this service, for instance, encourage them to attend it. You sit with them, you know. If you attend a small group Bible study, invite them along to that small group Bible study. If you're involved in a certain area of ministry, invite them to be involved in that area of ministry. And later, you know, we'll encourage them to discover their spiritual gifts. Remember we did that late last year? And in the journey of discovering spiritual gifts... It might be that they realise, you know, actually I think, I, I think I'm interested in pastoral care. Let's put up, put up that list of ministries. Well, if you're interested in pastoral care, have a, t- have a chat with Richard. Heads up that department. Or if you're interested in children's ministry, a bunch of kids out there doing something right now, have a chat with Kerry. Or if you're interested in doing something for youth, have a chat with Kane. Or if you're a musician or a singer, have a chat with Jason, your arranger and audition. If you're interested in tech, you know, whether it's um, PowerPoint and Clips or Sound Desk, have a chat with Roz or Tim. If you're interested in hospitality, the lady who stood up here and did announcements, have a chat with Roxanne. If it, you know, keeping this church looking nice, cleaned and sterilised, have a chat with Benjamin. Uh, older call prayer ministry, Susie, or Zoom prayer meetings, Mareka, welcoming, Helen, administration, Kerry, the list goes on. But the idea is in the journey towards the end of their discipleship, they're discovering how God shaped them. And in the journey of that, getting involved in ministry is actually one of the greatest growth tools in any new believer's life. Just imagine if, um, let's, let's, let's start small. Imagine if just 10, 10 of you, I'll include myself in this, if 10 of you was willing to say, I'm serious about this. I'm willing to try, endeavour to lead someone to Christ and make a disciple. I'm serious. Just 10 of you. Just imagine if 10 of you are willing to do that. Well, in the first year, it means we end up, you know, this year, we could end up with 10 disciples. Let's pop that up. Slide. Now, go back to the first one. Is there two before that? Yeah. So first year there, after this year, there could be 10 new believers who are able to lead someone to Christ and make a disciple. I'm pretty excited about that. But then you see, if they do that, and you keep on doing what you're doing as well, well, next year we end up with, what, 20. Next slide. So next year we could have 20 people who are equipped to share the gospel and make a disciple. Well, in Jesus' way of multiplying disciples, it just keeps building, doesn't it? What about next year? Year three, it could be 40. Year four, it could be 80. In five years, it could be 160 people who are able to lead someone to Christ and make disciples. Well, it's Jesus' model, but wouldn't it be awesome if we could start to implement that model? Wouldn't that be awesome? Well, friends, I reckon Roxanne could pray into this, and I reckon she'll do a great job of it. So let's invite her to the pulpit to close in prayer. Thank you, Roxanne. Thanks, Lee. I'd just like to, not that that needs adding to, but if you're all like me, you're sitting here and you're quaking in your boots a little bit, because this is really scary stuff. But I know from experience that God enables us And we just have to ask God and words come out of our mouths we don't even know we've got inside of us and opportunities arise that 
we just know God has put that situation there. So I just want to encourage you that if you are a little bit nervous about about this um, disciple ship making process that God will enable you you just have to make yourself available to him so let's pray into that now father god i just thank you lord for the words that lee has presented that have come from you this morning we thank you father god that we have this opportunity to share the gospel with other people. And Lord, as we we go about that, we don't have to do that in our own strength because we know, Lord, that you will provide. You'll provide opportunities, but you'll provide the words and you will provide the way. And Father, that you will give us the courage and the confidence that we do not have in our own strength, Lord, that you will give us your strength, in order to build your kingdom. And Lord, there is so much excitement about this. In amongst the the fear, there is an excitement that this is building your kingdom and that we have been given this incredible opportunity to be able to bring others to know the good news that we know, able to bring others to be part of the incredible experience of walking each day with you. And Lord, strengthen us. Give us opportunity, give us courage, and Lord, that you will give us your um, assurances that you will be with us every step of the way. And we pray, Lord, we pray, Lord, for your kingdom to be expanded as we are faithful and obey your call on our lives. And we commit this to you in your beautiful name.